Hey hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Plato's Cave. Now before jumping into it, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy if you want to mostly see pictures of my cats, or on Twitter at David Guigno. If you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts in a way that makes them accessible. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe. I'd like to see you back here. Comment. I'd like to hear from you. Reach out on any platform uh, that you may have found me on because you know, why not? Uh, if you're listening to this in podcast form, you'll be able to find the video on YouTube. If you're listening to this on YouTube, you'll be able to find it in podcast form where there shouldn't be any ads because obviously that's better. If you are listening to this in podcast form and it's on Apple Podcasts, leave a review. Five stars would obviously be great. And yeah, I don't want to waste any more of your time with that stuff. Let's talk about Plato's Cave. Now I bet the vast majority of you are familiar with this text, and I'm not going to claim to give you any more than you probably already know here. I'm just going to present it in great detail, uh, just so in case you wanted a refresher, or if you happen to not know about this idea, then you know it'll be probably pretty helpful for you. And you should know it if you're interested in philosophy at all, because it's a pretty seminal idea in the history of philosophy. Now this allegory this analogy of the cave, comes out in the Republic. And it immediately follows another allegory, or another analogy, and that's the analogy of the line, in which Socrates is trying to explain to Glaucon, who is Plato's older brother, about the process of arriving at intelligence. Now, this is a process that's quite difficult, and it goes through many different phases. Now, Socrates uses the image of a line, to illustrate this. And he takes a line and he divides it into four segments. So in the first segment, you have what he calls illusion. Now, this is the kind of knowledge we can obtain from reflections of things, like reflections in the water, shadows, that only give us a kind of artificial or simulated connection to the real world. Now from there, we move into what he calls belief. And it is here that we actually engage with things in the real world. So we can touch the tree, we engage with the tree, uh, touch the grass, other humans we can engage with, uh, we know that they're there, and so on. Then from here, we arrive at reason. So we're on the third segment here on this line, divided into four. We arrive at reason, and reason happens at the moment that we can abstract from daily life, from real objects in the world, to arrive at truths about those objects. So, for example, he gives the example of geometry, where if two people are discussing, let's say, Pythagoras' theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, they don't actually need to be engaging with a triangle, because there aren't really triangles in the world, per se, that just uh, have 180 degrees perfectly. You don't really find that in nature. But we have this kind of abstract concept that is based off of a thing that ostensibly could exist in the world. But when we discuss it, when geometricians, geomet geometers, ge when people who do geometry, what's wrong with me? When people who do geometry are talking about triangles, they don't actually bring out a picture of a triangle per se to discuss it. They already have the image in their head. Now, with this form of knowledge that he calls reason, we can arrive at conclusions based off of our knowledge about things in the world, things that we've uh, kind of agreed upon in terms of how many degrees a triangle is to have, things that we've observed and, and found out about the world, which is a great form of knowledge, but there's still something more. And this is what he calls intelligence. Now, of course, the Greek terms are different, and I'm not going to go into a whole big thing about that because simply I don't know them. I just don't have a strong enough grasp of Greek etymology or English etymology going all the way back to Greece that would allow me to discuss that. So these are just the terms that we have. So the fourth segment on this line, that is intelligence, is the point at which we have moved even beyond those abstractions into forms, which is a very elusive and difficult concept. And I in no way can give a proper kind of demonstration of what this is. And 
I think either this week or next week I'm doing an episode on Heidegger's The Question Concerning Technology in which this idea is going to come up again. But uh, for now, let me just say that when we are discussing a form of something, what we are discussing is the possibility of the things coming into being. Now, that is a very complicated idea, but let me put it this way. When we discuss a tree, we each have a mental image of a tree in our minds, where if I mention the word tree, you might think in your head, an evergreen tree, you might think a spruce, you might think a willow tree, whatever that image is that pops up into your head. Now, let's say, for example, we both thought of an evergreen tree. We aren't going into great detail about what kind of tree we're talking about, we're just talking about a tree, but we both happen to think about an evergreen tree. Those two mental images are going to be incredibly different. Like, no two trees are the same, let alone two trees that we construct within our mind's eye. Now, how is it then possible at all that we are able to have a kind of agreement between ourselves about the thing. Like, we've somehow developed the capacity to have uh, what I will just call a rational discussion about a thing based off of a misinterpretation on our part, because I'm thinking about one evergreen tree, you're thinking about another one, yet we can still agree, we can still converse, we can still arrive at conclusions based off of this. How is it, despite this kind of possible misinterpretation, we can still arrive at truth. We can still arrive at something that extends beyond it. Now, what binds all trees together and that what gives us the possibility of having this discourse is the form of the tree that kind of subtends that exists beneath all trees. Now, when we can get beneath appearances, when we can get beneath these mental images that we have, then we've arrived at the domain of forms. And it is in the domain of forms that all possible things are possible. That is, it is the place from which all things are made possible. So likewise in the work of Immanuel Kant, we might here think about the the idea of the noumenon, that thing that exists beneath experience that we can't actually touch or feel or, or understand, yet we know must be there. Now in this discourse between Socrates and Glaucon, in which Socrates describes this line, Glaucon is confused, naturally, because it's a very complicated idea. So it is at this moment that he introduces the idea of the cave. Now, I'm sure that many of us are familiar with this, but I'll run through it anyways. Now, in the cave are a number of prisoners, and they are set up in such a way so that they cannot move their heads, they cannot move their bodies in any way, and they are positioned to be staring at a wall. And they've been like this since childhood. Now, it's important to note, even though I don't know why, but it's important to note that they weren't born that way. But since childhood, they've been that way. It doesn't come up again, but anyways, it's just an important detail. Now, they're positioned in such a way to be looking at a wall that happens to operate as a projection screen. Now, a projection screen for what? Well, behind the prisoners is a fire within this cave. And between the fire and the projection screen is like a kind of road or a railway in which people can walk and uh, carry, carry things across or whatever. And their shadows, because of the fire emitting light that produces their shadows onto this projection screen, is then the only thing that these prisoners see. So again, they can't look at each other, they can't look at themselves, they're only looking at this projection screen, this kind of wall in which these shadows are projected. Now they see that, and they take that to be the truth. And so when people are talking outside, or on this like weird road in this cave or, or whatever, then they associate those sounds that they hear with those images on the screen. So of course the idea here is that they are not coming into contact with the truth, they are coming into contact with only, in terms of this line, with illusion, a reflection, a shadow of the truth. Now Plato extends this to say, well, imagine if one of these prisoners were to be released. So they finally have uh, kind of autonomy, they could move around and look around, and Plato says that they would probably find themselves 
in his words, or in the English translation, dazzled by the fire. So they'd look at the fire and it would, it would probably be blinding. Like you wouldn't be able to really see or comprehend it because all you'd see in your whole life was darkness up until that point. So they would probably retreat back to the, the shadows because they'd be like, what the hell is that? I don't like that. That hurts me. I'm going to go back to these shadows where I'm safe and that I've grown accustomed to. Now this produces a problem because then they won't actually be of their own volition willing to come to terms with the, the truth of the situation. So it would take people to drag them out, this person out, this prisoner out, into the light of day to open them up to the world. Now in this moment it would obviously be very troubling for them and they probably wouldn't be able to see anything at all because they they would have just been uh, kind of bombarded by light that they haven't been kind of put in contact with. Like UV rays, for any of us familiar with this phenomenon, if you walk out of your house after having been in COVID quarantine for too long, you, you know the feeling where you can't really see anything for a moment. Now imagine if your whole life was just living in pure darkness. How would that feel? So the idea here for Plato is that in this moment that the person comes out of this cave, the first things that they will probably be able to see would be shadows, just like the shadows that they saw in the cave, in their real world. Secondly, what they would be able to see are the actual things around them, the actual objects in the world through their sense perception. They can see and touch things and, and kind of make sense of them. Now, the last thing they would actually be able to look at would be the sun, this kind of producer of light. Now, it would follow then through enough training, through enough, uh, you know, contemplation on now the new nature of their lives, what they've come now to understand as being the truth of the matter, that is the shadows that they were living with were only representations of the real world. They would then be able to look at the real world and question it and derive various truths about it. Now this would enter us into the third stage of this going back to this line, the third stage in which we find reason. So they would through knowledge acquisition or through whatever means, they would derive the truth of the matter being that the sun, just like how in the cave the fire was giving life to the images, the sun is what gives life to all perception. All living things on this world are essentially indebted to the sun. So likewise, all things in the cave then are indebted to the sun, this kind of original true point that is able to give life to all things. Now, after having been exposed to this truth and these various truths that they've acquired, they probably wouldn't want to go back to the cave because once they did, they probably wouldn't be able to see anything just because they would need to acclimate themselves back to it. But why? It would just be a kind of struggle for them at this point to make themselves more ignorant or to engage with a world that is lesser than the world of truth from which they have now uh, descended from back into the cave. But let's say hypothetically that they did and they were to converse with the prisoners that are still down there. They would might say like, I can't see anything. You need to help me. You need to guide me here. Now for the prisoners that are down there that have remained there the entire time, this person who had left actually has a lesser understanding of the world because they can't, they can no longer see, they can no longer properly uh, engage with the shadows on the walls. So to the people down there, this person is seen as being more intellectually maybe, more um, sensorially impoverished than they are because this person is not engaging with the truth of the world that these prisoners are or believe themselves to be privy to, that they are engaging with on a day-to-day -day basis. And they might even grow hostile to anyone that told them, hey, you know what? This is not the truth. The truth is out there. To which they would say, clearly not because you are you're unable to see in this truth that we exist in now. And if we went out there to where you say this truth is, we would lose our ability like you to actually see what is going on here in the real world. Now the idea here for Plato is that there is this world that exists beneath the world we take to be true. So we can't interpret this as being a literal illusion, a literal 
allegory for the process of arriving at intelligence, because as soon as we actually entered this or exited the cave, we are still confronted with various issues, like how do we actually do proper conduct? How do we uh, organize people in such a way as to foster their creative potential? How do we actually negotiate the problem of justice, of good, of right, of truth? We're still confronted with all these problems. Looking at the sun as being the original point of all this doesn't give us any answers. But he uses this allegory to point to the fact that so long as we are not asking these questions, so long as we are not engaging with these assumptions that we have about our interactions with the world as being true, as being all there is, then we are going to be stuck in a state of kind of arrested development, much like those prisoners within the cave. And it is the duty for Plato of various philosophers, what he calls philosopher rulers, or in other translations, philosopher kings, to teach the populace about this possibility, because it is the duty, it is the obligation of philosophers to go down this route, to find the realm of forms that subtends, that underlines all possible experience, and that gives the very possibility of any discussion, for example, of what is good, of what is right. Now, the big blow here is to Thrasymachus or to other interlocutors in the Republic who are saying, like, there's no such thing as truth, there's no such thing as the good. It's all, you know, it's culturally determined, for example. To which this point, and within Plato's cave, the allegory that is more broadly, he is demonstrating that the very propensity for us to discuss what is good demonstrates that we have, there's something that we are not aware of. The very possibility for us to pose morals, the very possibility for us to say that something was wrong, even if it is subjective, points to the fact that there is something beyond just pure experience. Because otherwise, there would be no reason to do anything at all. Yet we do things, we contemplate, we wonder, we question, and that really points to us as being more or having the potential to open ourselves up to more to this realm of forms that exists above and beyond experience. Now, various issues can arise here because recall how the philosopher, the person who left the cave, re-entered the cave. They appeared to be quite asocial. They seem to have lost the ability to speak to the people there because they are now on a different plane. They are now, they see the world entirely differently that they can't just interact with the, the common folk in such a, a neat way. But we saw the same thing happen when they first exited the cave. That is when they were elevating themselves into the realm or closer to the realm of forms to intelligence because they were kind of dazzled. They, they couldn't actually engage with it in that way. So there's a kind of dual, D-U-A-L, a dual bewilderment that occurs in this process. We're from either going upwards towards intelligence or downwards towards illusion, we lose our attachment to people and things that exist there just because we are coming from another place, another frame of mind, which poses various issues in that how are these philosopher kings, how are these philosopher rulers supposed to actually communicate what they have learned to the people in a way that they will understand it? And part of the duty for Plato is to bridge this project with an embodied relationship to reality, not just a kind of intellectual endeavor that is about accruing as much knowledge as possible, because that just regresses into the accumulation of facts, which Plato would find just extremely boring. It must be grounded in reality, where he says that you have to turn yourself to the sun. You have to turn yourself to this original point. It's not just something you can do by thinking. You can't think yourself into this domain. It has to be an embodied experience. So it is the obligation of these philosopher rulers to descend constantly, repeatedly, back down into the cave in order to teach people, to tell them about the possibilities that is afforded to them by thinking. And the point of this is to really elevate the whole to make as many people as possible aware of these possibilities. And that is more or less it, uh, at least what I'm willing to cover here in 20 minutes. 
there is more to it, and there's a lot of debates that go on about this text, like what the forms actually are, how this actually relates to the rest of the Republic, and so on. Uh, and I'm not an expert on Plato in any way, but if anyone wants to chime in, I would love to hear about it. You know, leave a comment or in a review on a, a podcast platform. I, I'd love to read them. And if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends who knows they might get a kick out of this. And yeah, catch you next time.